Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. And it's my pleasure to welcome attendees to this, what looks to be a very rich and uh, unusual session. The reasons that Tom Gamarino, the moderator, will explain shortly. And also to welcome, the, <coughs> welcome this panel, which is um, uh, a large one, probably the largest one we've, we've run uh, in the entire festival. Um, so over to you, Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much for sp sponsoring this event and um, for inviting me to host it. Uh, I am Tom Gamarino. I am the editor, one of the editors of, of this, ish, this brand new issue of Bamboo Ridge, Snaring New Suns, subtitled Speculative Works from Hawaii and Beyond. Um, and I, I'm also, I'm a teacher. I'm a writer of, of speculative fiction and I'm a teacher of speculative fiction. I teach high school. I teach 11th and 12th grade at Punahou School. And uh, I teach a science fiction class and a magical realism class. And it was actually one of my former students, Alyssa Lowe, um, who came up with the idea for this, this issue. She was my student at Punahou and went to college and then came back and was a, um, an intern at Bamboo Ridge. And I guess in an editorial meeting, she floated the idea, how about a speculative issue? And I know somebody who should maybe be one of the editors. And so that's how this happened. Um, there are other histories in, in, involved in the history of, of this issue. Um, my co-editors are uh, Brian Quada and uh, Kalee McKenzie and Liz Soto. So I want to just say thank you to them too. This was a really fun project to work on. And yeah, it's hard to believe it's, you know, it's really in the world. There's this thing that's in your, in your head and in your discussions for so long, and then it's an object and it's, it's thrilling. It's also unlike anything Bamboo Ridge has ever done before. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe points the way to some kind of future. I don't know. That's something we'll probably talk about. So I'm delighted to be joined by uh, five, five contributing writers to this issue who are going to read their stuff for five, about five to seven minutes each. And then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, I want to invite everybody, all the participants here, I mean, all the people who are watching this to in the chat, you know, if you want to just tell us who you are and, or, or where you and where you are, that'd be cool. Um, but also to you populate the chat with your questions as they arise and, and we will get to them. Um, toward the end of the talk. So we're going to start with uh, Ahimsa. If that's okay with you, Ahimsa, yeah, all good? Okay. And I will introduce you. Ahimsa Timoteo Barone is a multimedia artist, activist, and organizer, critic, and educator. A Tulsa Artist Fellow and National Endowment for the Arts Fellow, he is the author of Archipelagos, Antis y Después del Bronx, uh, Lenape Hoking, and South Bronx Breathing Lessons, editor of the International Queer Indigenous Issue of Yellow Medicine Review, and co-editor of the Native Dance Movement Performance Issue of Movement, Movement Research Performance Journal. He has received scholarships and fellowships from the Voices of Our Nation's Arts Foundation, Canto Mundo, Radius of Arab American Writers, Macondo, and Lambda Literary. His work appears throughout the Pacific, Australia, Asia, the Americas, Africa, Europe, and the Arab world. So Ahimsa, I am yielding the floor to you. Uh, mahalo, it's good to be here with everyone. I'm going to put into the chat um, just where I'm based, gender pronouns, and also a link to the video version of um, the longer piece, which I'm going to be reading an excerpt tonight, um, that's in the um, issue. So um, just first want to say it's an honor to be here with everyone and to um, be reading as part of an, a Bamboo Ridge um, reading, like Bamboo Ridge has published my work in the past, and I have a lot of love for um, the people who envision and keep running this very powerful multi multicultural journal out of Hawaii, and just much love um, to my relations there and um, tonight, I'm calling in from uh, the greater Chicago area, 
which is um, traditional territory for Potawatomi, Sac and Fox and Miami peoples. And I'm usually based right now in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is Muskogee, Cherokee and Osage territory. So it's good to be here with you all. I'm gonna be reading um, the first two sections of one of the pieces that's in the book. And that piece is Emissaries from the Arab World and Vision, a Queer Trans Arab Multiverse. One, continually folding, expanding, we tesseract, we multiply and permutate. There are floodings of fluids, the way gas expands, we ignite. We are plasma of blood pulsing and stars igniting themselves in night sky. Our darkness is infinite. We are matter and energy immeasurable by white standards. There are new observatories for us to see ourselves. We look backwards and forwards in space-time. We are new astronomers reshaping astrolabes to chart ancient seas, how deep our water is, salty, brackish, fresh, chlorine. We are all the elements on the chart tessellating, periods pulsing, becoming semicolons, slipping into commas, convulsing into ellipses. So many ovular orbits we synchronize, our syntax shakes systems. Supernovae, there are nuclear reactions, fission and fusion, stray electrons, neutrinos shooting through planets across galaxies, gravitons. I am seeking you soulmate across echoes, black holes, ejecta. Perhaps in this galaxy or universe you are not, but you are traversing planes to reach me. I wait for you in the future and in the past. There is such a presence here. I feel you across nebulae, arteries redshifting the blueprints of our alveoli, re-oxygenated galactic filaments, plural walls, souls supercluster around each other, beyond binary, we circle each other's paths. So many comets entering and leaving our systems, burning and icing cycles, venting and sealing interstellar seed vaults. Some trace memory of what we were that we might become again, such cosmic dust and ash, vestigial, swirling. Two. All these stars are ours so named, as if we belong to them, familial, as if our destinies are already consecrated, constellated in the systems we visit before we came here, before we, many vesseled, birthed from waters, primordial, pre and post-human, these humidities, these wetnesses within and between our flesh. Our desires ever darkening, illuminating infinite, our skins radiantly reflective of rainbows our irises can't register yet. So ultraviolet, infrared, heat and hearing, scored and searing, micro and radio waved, X and gamma rayed, our genders galloping unbound, recombinant, glistening in our resurgent tetrachromacies. I want to feel you fully unbridled in all my matrimonial senses. The scent of your lightning lingering after storm, taste and touch thunderclap, my body recovering. Hold me holding you upright, rebalance my proprioception, echo locate these emissions. Nocturnal, the electricity between us lights up the dark, static, somatic, we see each other in glimpses, know each other through brief embraces, trace back in blood all that we were before. So those are the first two sections of this longer piece. Um, it's a video um, that I was commissioned to create for So the Darkness May Glitter, Queer and Trans Arab Futures, which was a screening curated by Jenny Moganam for the Queer Cultural Center's 2021 National Queer Arts Festival. And I just wanna say, both in terms of that um, commission, as well as the loving labor of these editors, like the work that's done to gather together and bring our voices into the world. And so that we can imagine new relationships to our past, our presence, our futures is such a gift. So it's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. Wow. Um... Wow, C cosmic is the word that comes to mind. I, I feel I feel bigger, having heard all that. <laughs> um, 
Also, I, I tell my science fiction students um, that I am the right teacher for that class, not only because my birthday is January 2nd, which is National Science Fiction Day, um, but because my name, Gamarino, is a contraction of gamma rays and neutrinos, both of which were in your piece. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, all right. Our next, our next reader is Sloan Leong. Sloan is a cartoonist artist and writer of Hawaiian, Chinese, Mexican, Native American, and European ancestries. She's written and drawn two acclaimed graphic novels, Prism Stalker and A Map to the Sun, and has short fiction credits with Fireside Magazine, Dark Matter Magazine, and Entropy Magazine. She was raised on Maui and is currently living on Chinook land near what is known as Portland, Oregon. Um, and as an effect of living in Portland, Oregon, Sloan is not quite up to, to reading tonight because of the wildfires there. Um, so I'm gonna pinch read for Sloan, but I wanna give her a chance um, before I do to, um, to set us up if she wants. Is there anything you wanna say, Sloan? Yeah, totally. And thank you again for reading for me. So I'm not uh, hacking up a lung on, on, on the Zoom. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, the story, uh, it's called Stars May Hunger, Suns May Still. Um, it's kind of just an exercise in world building um, and exploring kind of like a, a kind of like a legacy within this tribe of women um, that are exiled uh, to this cold, isolated planet out in the middle of some nowhere star system. Um, and in this excerpt that Tom's going to read for us, uh, it follows our protagonist. Her name is Sangi. Um, as she watches another girl, um, a younger girl, go through an adulthood ritual. Um, with an indigenous alien creature, um, one she hasn't been able to experience herself. That's so exciting. I get to read that? Yes. Wow. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Sloan has assured me that um, some of the words in this story have never actually been pronounced before. So I'm, I'm not at risk of getting them wrong. I was happy to hear that. Cool. Okay, here we go. You know what? The third word is one. You want to just give me a start, Sloan? Kalipuk? Kalipuk? Kalipuk works. Okay. Yeah. To the Kalipuk belonged the ocean, its churning blackness, its endless ravines, and the unknown life that it continued birthing forth from its depths like a vast abyssal womb. To the Wahinak belonged the ice fields and the rivers, its swiftness and freshwater meadows, the streams like unwavering blue veins traversing the white body of the land. Through that blueness, the, women, the women's paddles cut. Three narrow canoes sliced through the crisp waters in silent procession. Sangi and Nasa paddle besides, besides each other with six more wahinak in pairs paddling behind them. They are heading towards the mouth of the river where it empties into the sea, a sacred place of cyclic sacrifice that would honor the impending ceremony. They steer the boat to a makeshift dock to the south side of the river and tie off the canoes. Iame disembarks first. She is small for her 13 seasons, black braids wrapped around her head and woven with yellow reeds, green shells. A wrap of tanned delver hide fits around her hips and a wash of red clay from top lip to clavicle, from fingertip to elbow. Her belly is carefully etched with a blade, three stippled arcs curving neatly around her belly button, matching the contours of her stomach muscles. She walks out onto a jetty of black and red stone, the brackish sea slapping at her legs. Her gait is unbalanced, a side effect from her unbroken fast and the smoke of a particularly potent reed pipe meant to cloud the mind as well as the body's sense of pain. At the end of the jetty, she stands and waits. Sang had been invited to two ceremonial pilgrimages before. This was Nasa's first, and she feared her reaction, worried her scorn for the creatures would only grow at the sight of them. Sangi whispers, okay, kai ku? Fine. Nasa sits stiffly, hands gripping her paddle tight as if anticipating an attack. I'm not scared. I didn't say you were. You might have, beyond Iame and the jetty, a single tentacle rises up. Nasa inhales sharply. The first Wahinak had said the Kalipuk resembled Terran creatures like the salamander, the whale, the octopus, and the anemone, yet none fully encompassed the fearsome air the Kalipuk had. 
Slow as drifting ice, it ascends out of the sea. Dark waters cascade from its black spine, and a musk fills the air, heavy with brine and an unfamiliar floral sweetness. It pulls itself into the shallows by the jetty, a myriad of thin tentacles rippling down along the length of its body like a bird forever ruffling its feathers. Its six wide fins, tipped in stubby claws, clutch the rocks to maneuver itself. The care it takes settling its massive head down on the jetty is more frightening to Sangi than its rows of crushing teeth. The Kalapuk's belly glints shell white in the daylight, catching the light and refracting it into Sangi's eyes. Along its tentacled flank, three stripes color into existence. This was the Kalapuk's resting marks, the same pattern that had been cut into Iame and every other woman that had gone through their first blood. It was the first step to their binding and the ache of the tattoo would serve as preparation as to what was to come. The Kalapuk sucks in great bellowing breaths. A low groan vibrates the pebbles under Iame's soles. Sangi, Nasa, and the other Wahinak disembark and take their seat on the stony beach, ready to witness the exchange. Each Wahinak has come with a hollow gourd, and together they begin beating out a rhythm, steady as the tide lapping at the craggy coast. Yame nears the Kalipuk. She barely reaches the top of its shoulder. Swaying, she reaches out, placing both shaking hands, both shaking hands against the side of its slimy stomach, just behind its foremost shoulder. The pelt of tentacles flinch, then flatten into a glossy, smooth surface. The echo of the beaten gourds hammer in the air. An oily cascade of colors radiates out from where her palms rest on the Kalapuk's skin. Translucent goo thickens between her painted fingers and seeps over her knuckles. The iridescence, mark, marks, the iridescence marks leap across its ribs, the deep rainbow blemish suddenly darting one end of its belly to the other. The shape blushes into symmetry, then fades a deeper color, the hue of rich soil. Yame blinks. The pattern on the Kalapuk's skin blinks back, two white dots flashing red and then white again. Yame stumbles back. The colors on the Kalapuk move in tandem. It has painted her reflection in its skin, a living, breathing mirror, a signal of kinship between their two peoples, a mating gift, a mark of acceptance. Iame raises her hands back to the Kalapuk's ribs, her skin painted reflection mimicking her in liquid shimmers and salted glitter. With slow precision, she signs into the wetness of its body. I welcome you. This would be one of the last times Iame would speak to the Kalapuk, unless she became leader or counsel. For people like Sangi's mother, Malek, their leader, they communicated frequently. The ancestral Wahinak had found speaking through tactile sign the best way to communicate with the Kalapuk, whose sensitive tendrils lent themselves perfectly to tactile speech. What is it like to touch them? Sangi wonders, to feel their color change under your palms. The Kalapuk exhales a content hiss, vibrating as its dark body shifts to a searing blue decorated with intricate whorls of white. The white pigment spins and collects along its body like building storm clouds. Yame moves toward the Kalapuk's head and strokes down the sloped muzzle, fingers dancing on the tips of its long serrated teeth hanging perilously over its lip. Tendrils unbraid across its flank and lift, revealing hundreds of opalescent disc-like barnacles anchored across its side and belly. With a tender touch, it pries one away from its flesh loosing a cloudy green liquid Sangi knows to be its blood. The sea shimmers emerald. Gingerly, the Kalapuk offers the hard carapace to Iame, who receives it with quivering hands. The barnacle was just barely convex, no bigger than Iame's hand. Fleshy coils of blue-gray meat twitched on its underside. The beat of the gourds slows and Sangi feels her heart follow suit nervously. Iame hesitates then presses the underside of the shell to her belly. She is still for several heartbeats, she is still for several heartbeats before a cry rips from her throat. This is the part Sangi has heard much of, the invertebrate sinking its penetrating tendril into her stomach to her womb, tiny filaments latching onto fragile organs. EMA sinks to her knees in pain, cupping the shell that has joined itself to her, giving her the gift that all the Wahinak are lacking the ability to bear children. The gourd song rises in urgent tempo as Iame screams. The sea crashes a chorus and the Kalapuk 
hums a sweet low tune, louder than all of the Wahinak together. Diame's voice cuts off in a choked whine before she collapses to the jetty. The song of her adulthood right plays on into the light of the white sun, the shade of the black ocean, into the jealous heat of Sange's heart. Yeah, well, for you. Hey, thank you. You're such a good reader. That was so awesome to hear. Oh, what a <laughs> what a pleasure. It, it reads itself. And I, I love the verbs. I found myself within a page, like really looking forward to each verb because they're, they're carefully chosen. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That was awesome. Um, all right. Our next reader is Kalani. Kalani Padilla. Was raised on Oahu in, in Mililani the descendant of immigrants from Ilocos Norte. Since moving to Spokane, Washington for school, her writing practice and soul have been nourished by deep roots in both the islands and the Pacific Northwest. Kalani is currently a graduate student of poetry and teacher of writing at the University of Montana in Missoula. She hopes her creative and academic pursuits bring her home one day. Kalani. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, for your moderating and also for the work that you do mentoring people in this art. Um, I remember that it was a teacher of mine that first encouraged us to um, submit our short stories to a journal I was actually required to. And that actually ended up being my first publication, which was with Bamboo Ridge in, um, I think, 2017. And I have been chasing um, chasing writing ever since. So thank you for that. Thank you to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival for um, putting, like, bringing us all into this funny thing. Like writers who can feel like an like island sometimes, um, and it's easier to see the archipelago when events like this are held. Um, and also, I see my family in the attendees list, and this reading is for you for tolerating my diasporic state. <laughs> In a way, speculative fiction is, uh, speculative literature in the form is a way for me to imagine being, what it means to be a family, even with distance as a family member, and that's hopefully present in the book about to read. I have three of them. Um, this first one, um, Lost Connection. I'm back. Okay. If you're holding the book, you'll find that um, these are all revised because I am not a rule follower and I literally um, edit at the podium. So my first poem um, was not published as I'd intended because it starts with a song, which obviously is just enough. Not really. But I'm going to sing it, which is a great way, um, you know, to give back to that writing. Um, if you know the song, please sing it along with me because it's a weird song to be sung to sing on one's own. And I think if you know this song, you'll understand why. Well, you know, I'm, um, sorry to inter Papa, like I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, <laughs> yes. but we're getting a lot of sound. I don't know if it's you or if someone else has their mic on. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's my um, papers. I'm oh, shuffling of papers. Okay. Over. That's what it is. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. This song, it's a funeral song called E Papa. Um, I think that's all you need to know. Then I'll just keep reading. Funeral Song in Torrance, California. E papa waiari takune mahi takune mahi e tukuroi mata e oe e oe kamate ao e hine this is the translation. Uncle Wayari, all I've been doing, all I can do is weep. I might die if you don't return to me. If my beloved doesn't return, I may die. Here's the poem. It wasn't my family. So after the service, I drifted nearby watching them shred lemons into Keleguen and Kanikapila. I watched them pour their together years out and into plastic cups and playing cards, all red and blooming beer. It's vulgar, this wanting in me to love their loved one. 
and only after the ellipses of surfers and tea leaves and orchids, only after his spirit had risen from the waters of Redondo. But soon and one by one, auntie, nephew, cousin came over to touch the gate between my life and theirs, to open it and somehow welcome me more into me. They roped me into their front yard songs and then their backyard songs, grief restrung to tie themselves to me, grief spelled in slack key and flung toward me. Cousin, sing us something, sing us a song from Hawaii. Mine and cousin's names both mean that we are of heaven. Mine and uncle's names are both words for child. Mine and uncle's names both mean ways for water to fall. This is Sailbone. In my dream last night, my grandmother's voyages were visiting my other etymologies. She said, your children's names will mean they have ancestors. They have ancestors to answer for. In my dream, she called me to chart the goings of our bones. They smooth out into mountains between shoulders of singing wind. They lay their battles for immortality down in the ocean time. Tarsals planting themselves like oars in the sea or seeds over and over. In my dream, I hovered with my sisters on the old reef, belly down, and with my brothers knocked on the bamboo as bamboo knocks on each other year to year. In my dream, I learned pain's map of healing, of the jigsaw borders of forgiveness, where love for the traveler, the transgressor, still exists. I have one more poem. This poem draws on the mythology of the Menehune. Um, in Hawaiian mythology, I think the important thing to know is that they are builders of things, they're masters of their craft, but they only build at nighttime. And once um, night ended, they had to like stop their work and whatever wasn't finished was left unfinished. So that's the part of the myth that pertains to this. Um, this is for my dad. It's called Menehune Men. All around are the things he's built. The clean edge in the grass, the two-tiered chicken coop where mom's darlings live, the shelves that keep the hurricane water cubed, stacked, and dated, keep the memory of Iniki and the solutions to Iniki within reach. Our whole house has known his touch, touch of the water hose that gardeners, that cab drivers, that union man and cane workers lasso. Our dads built our homes in the night since they built other men's homes by day. As it is told, Whatever stones did not make it to the fish pond wall by moonset, the Menehune men mourned and left there in an unstacked cairn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalani. That was uh, exquisite. And man, it's, you know, you read these things on the page and they're beautiful, but they're, it is really nice to, to hear these things embodied even in the case of Sloan by me, I guess I would have preferred to hear Sloan read, but um, this is, I just feel really, you know, I say I'm grateful all the time. I'm, I thank people, but I feel it a little extra. It's a little more sincere right now. I'm, I'm really uh, just delighted to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, next, we have Yasmin Romero. Yasmin Romero is an associate professor of English uh, at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. She grew up in Saipan. Uh, um, of the Northern Marianas Islands and Boise, Idaho. Her forthcoming book, Moving Across Whirlpools, Intersectionality in Writing and Language Studies, combines her research interests in intersectionality, critical narrative studies, and translingualism. Currently, she is researching intersections across teacher training, language attitudes towards pidgin and English, and language policies in K-12 schools in Hawaii. She is also working on a short story collection of feminist revisions of legends and fairy tales. 
Yasmin. Thank you, Tom, and thank you everyone for sharing. Um, it's really nice to hear everyone speak uh, their words. Uh, this particular piece that I'm going to read is a revision of the legend of Chief Taga. Um, it's also a love letter to all the strong Tremora women that I've grown up with throughout my life. Uh, and I'm also a learner of Chamorro. I'm reconnecting to uh, my mom's uh, communities um, as well as my own. Uh, and it's been a big process and this is a part of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and read. <laughs> Chief Taga was tall and broad. He lumbered rather than walked. Every sunrise, he made his way to their makeshift quarry by walking through the surrounding latte houses. A Tao, not soon after she could walk, accompanied him in a stumbling sort of way. Tata never offered to carry her, and so she quickly adapted to the ever-shifting terrain. Earth and plants alike favored her, curling into her toes to prevent her from falling or catching her hair to stop her from encountering dangerous creatures like feral pigs, flying foxes, and rats. Even when the rain softened the dirt, creating sucking noises as she lifted each foot, a towel was nimble enough to stay, at the very least, three steps behind her father. Sometimes the adults would greet her. Sometimes the children would make faces. A towel made them right back because she is Taga's daughter. Nang's voice was melodic, almost always sounding amused. A Tao had known Nang, her strong set of hands, her chants that moved others to tears, even her own Tata. Her body moved to the sound of wind, coaxing coconut tree leaves to shake, to shiver. Her eyes were a deep, unnatural green-blue that saw lies before they even bubbled up. Some of the elders said that it was rumored Nang was more fish than woman. A Tao saw that in Nang's restlessness. Isaguela spoke of her restlessness often and how she uh, often outright refused her. No daughter refuses her mother, other than Nang. She was impenetrable like a reef, and that could have been why Tang died so young. He always followed Nang's lead, what to do, where to go, and how to do it. And so, on the night that Nang took sick, and Tang had to find his own way in scattered thunderstorms from the standing house to the canoe and then back, he was struck by a tree. Nana always began to cry when talking about Tang, even though Tiha Tai Tasi comforted her with, no, no, he's still here somewhere. Nang did not remarry, but created wealth in Tang's stead. She fashioned uh, fishing nets that villagers' mouths never broke. She sang verses with such feeling that the jungle shook in honor of her. She transformed her daughters into powerful women, one married to the chieftain, Nana, and the other mistress to Fuuna and Putan, Tiha Taitasi. You have to keep moving, Nang grinned uh, past blackened teeth. Her leathery hands wrapped about a Tao's face. Her eyes were the scales of parrotfish. So you don't end up like the banana trees, rotten after a short life. Taga tended the quarry so that he could continue to build for his family and village. He also enjoyed working with stone more than challenging people to tests of strength, which he would never admit. His hands forced limestone to bend, submit, yield. His fingers felt the beat of Fuuna's heart and encouraged her to beat faster, slower, stop. Atau often watched him under a blooming tiger claw, seeing how the lines of his body bent and straightened in their craft. She wondered if she could be like him someday. Atau eyed limestone nearby, unshaped, moving Nini. When not working stone, Taga's upright posture was imposing. His brown skin glistened with sweat. His brows furrowed in a constant state of seriousness, as though a typhoon would come unannounced upon them, spread its wings, wrap them in the whirls of water and wind, bring them to Tiha Taitasi's side. While Atao's Tata did not complain about the work, he treated his hands meticulously. Tata would rub at the base of his palms where wrist met hand, Pain softened the corners of his eyes, though fleeting, and she knew that he was still grounded in their island. He was still her father. See, Tihu said, your Tata thinks he's the strongest. Tihu laughed heartily. His dark shoulders shook into the memory. He's always been this way. Tihu folded his legs so that he could animate the story of the canoe turned swimming race from Tinian to Luta, its tensions and its conclusion. A draw, Tata never boasts again. Tihu feels redeemed to be recognized as just as strong, just as worthy of chieftain. 
Atal had heard the story since it occurred at least a dozen times, but she could not deny Tihu his narrative, his source of strength. Your Tata said, we each have four puntan sleeps to prepare. Your brothers were put to work and your mother and eldest sister tasked with providing food, yeah? I, on the other hand, put to work some of the men that owe me in the village. Atau nodded. When the sun rises, that beautiful puntan left eye, I assembled the men. We worked just as hard and prepared the dokdo properly in the span of a day. My muscles hurt, as did your tatas, I am sure, although I don't think he'd admit. Confess, Atau blurted. Don't, Tihu said. Don't talk like them. Something changed then in Tihu's mouth and eyes, a tightening of his upper lip. We don't confess. We share. We say. We. Enough a maulik. Enough a maulik. Thank you. Awesome. Th thank you, Yasmin. That's, that's awesome. And it, it makes me think about how much I love the range in this thing about what in this in this issue that is about um you know what we're counting as speculative and so we I think we'll talk about that in, in a little bit um speaking of which anybody in the audience uh if you have a question by all means please put it in the chat and we will get to it um otherwise we'll come up with our own uh, our final our final reader is Don Wallace Don Wallace is the editor of the Hawaii Review of Books and contributing editor of Honolulu Magazine. Um, his books are The French House, One Great Game, and Hot Water. Essays and stories have appeared in Harper's, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Surfer's Journal, Bamboo Ridge, Snake Nation Review, Fast Company, etc. Uh, and as a documentary writer, um, Those Who Came Before, The Musical Journey of Eddie Kamae. Uh, his awards include the Loretta D. Petrie Award, Pluma de Plata, Body of Work, Society of Professional Journalists, more at donwallacewriter.com. He lives on Oahu with his wife, writer, and surfer, Mindy. Um, Don, I'll let you tell us how to say um, her middle name. Unsu. 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 Yeah. Pennybacker. Yeah. Don Wallace. Well, most people have problems with their last name. Um, oh, did I get it right? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. Um, so thank you all. And of course, um, this is really an amazing evening. And as I was saying before, it's an amazing collection that we should really compliment these editors who put this together. You know, Tom and Brian and Kelly and Lynn. Um, and, you know, I, I remember interviewing Brian for his story like in 2018, and he said the most important or most interesting work coming out of Hawaii was in a speculative sci-fi genre. Uh, the LBGQ stuff was coming out of there because it was finding new ways to talk and speak and new audiences. And, um, and then the other thing is I think we see from everyone here is, is writing about islands, the islands you come from or the, you know, uh, the different cultures that we all kind of bring here. Um, is an encounter of its own. And speculative fiction is, always seems to be about encountering something. Um, I grew up in Long Beach, California, and I'm so old that it was actually Ray Bradbury was a new thing. Um, and he was sort of like, uh, he was our New Yorker. We didn't, you know, when he wrote about the Martian Chronicles, we knew he was writing about us and our swimming pools. Um, you know, we were a sci-fi generation. And uh, I didn't care much for what was called literature. Sci-fi was, to me, what I wanted to read. Um, so it's kind of funny. I end up on the other end, you know, like with the high Hawaii Review of Books. And I want to encourage everyone here, all our readers tonight and everyone who want to apply or submit, please take a look at uh, hawaiireviewofbooks.com. And um, with that, I'll say the encounter in um, The Bluest Angel, the story I have, is a bug. And um, it is also set in Hawaii. And I noticed both Yasmin's and uh, Sloan's piece, um, instead of reading the opening, they kind of jumped to the next section. And I think that's a really cool thing to do. And maybe we should all dispense with openings from now on. I know I'm going to dispense with mine and take my glasses off. Um, so The Bluest Angel, and it's about a guy named Bob. He stumbled out into the sunlight. Day hot, light redoubled from the magnification of white cement sidewalk and mirrored plate glass. 
He took it full in the face, swayed, stunned. It was as if the tables were turned and he was a specimen slide under a microscope. The truck interior was roasting, the vinyl seat burning through his khakis like a hot iron. But what a relief to be outside. It always felt like flight. Out of the office, Bob is a Ranger Rick in full possession of his Swiss Army knife of faculties. Bachelor of Science, Masters of this and that, 12 years, flat footing it as a lab assistant and teaching assistant. One giant step, a breakout move, going to the Big Island, to Indo, Sada Wall, going buggy, they joked, going for a doctorate, insects, insects on the brain. Still, it was worth it, Dr. Bob, if you please. And then, no jobs, a recession, a freeze on hires, no promotion, a change of priorities, 15 stutter step years. And now he's too old, they hint, to climb the upward track. So could you please get out of the way and turn the page? Get out of the way, pipe down, step aside, give a chance to someone else more qualified. Read, younger, less opinionated, who brings malasadas, doesn't scarf them. He shifts the state truck into drive and heads off to make the rounds. Plant and livestock disease control, pest control, invasives control, that's his kuleana, his responsibility. Just like they justify destroying the reef with a dredged artificial beach and call it for the keiki, the children, the tourist children, of course. It's all a matter of perspective. His route takes him south and toward the water's edge. He has a line of traps, just like Jeremiah Johnson, one of his heroes, the best of the old Rocky Mountain trappers, only instead of beaver, he traps bugs. His job is secure. There's always another infestation, the coffee borer, the ohia rust, the other plagues visited on Hawaii. He's had a report of a coconut palm at a dangerous tilt at Leahi Park at the foot of Diamond Head, hollowed out into a gray husk over the course of a week. It's a goner. The crew is scheduled to cut it down, and Bob is hanging up glue traps to capture the culprit. They know who it is, of course. The coconut rhinoceros borer beetle showed up from the Southeast Asia a couple of years ago. Look, the coquie frog from Puerto Rico, it's cute, kind of. If you like shiny beetles with interesting serrated legs and scary mandibles, he's got one in each trap. The traps are big black boxes that hang like lanterns from tree limbs. Not from coconut trees, of course. They don't have limbs, only fronds, but the surrounding trees. In the third trap in Leahi Park, there's a third victim, same size, different color. He stops to check it out. This one is not just different, it's totally different, as in species. And if a coconut rhinoceros borer beetle is kind of cool from an evolutionary standpoint, if ruthless and relentless, like all the invasives, this one is flat out gorgeous in a weird sci-fi way. It's, it's a one and a half inch Christmas ornament of shimmer, glitter, coruscating mirrored facets with a drop dead beautiful coloration scheme. Nature has done herself proud here. Metallic blue, green, orange, just outstanding. Good work, insect god. It looks dead, he touches it, it wiggles moving its thick midsection on the glue trap as he pulls his fingertip back, it convulses and you can see the chain of exoskeletal effort pulsing down to the stinger or arm, only one of its type. It's a stinger all right, the fucker was going for him. Well, he's got the jump, the upper hand. Evolution is on Bob's side today because Bob has a four inch pin and with one deft move, he impales the beetle under the glue trap. Sorry, buddy. Ow, Jesus. The thing just gave him an electric shock. Strange, weird, impossible. So yeah, unrelated, a tweak of his funny bone, that curious nerve, but it sure did hurt. We'll leave it at there because we all know something is gonna happen now to Bob. And unfortunately to Earth, um, so thank you all, and I want to say thanks again uh, for a great evening of reading and excitement. And now we can all unmute and talk, right, Tom? 
Yeah, I think it, it is that time. And I'm glad you said something about your story heading in a, a more speculative direction because it sure does. Um, <laughs> what, what you read there could, could have been realism, but uh, no, this one, this one really is uh, out there. Don's channeling Bradbury. Yeah. And yeah. maybe well, thank you. Hofka. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So it looks like we've got a little bit of time for questions. I have not gotten any questions in the chat from the audience. So we're just going to talk amongst ourselves. Um, the first question I have is one I've hinted at already. And it's that, you know, we, this is for everybody. Um, we obviously cast a, a pretty wide net with, for this issue with regard to what we mean by speculation cast a wide net. I guess that's a pun. I didn't intend it, but I do now. Um, so I wonder if each of you could just say a little bit about, um, you know, you submitted to a call, call for submissions for speculative work. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Why do you think of your work as speculative and what kind of speculation is it? We've got stories in here that are clearly science fiction. We have some that are kind of other sorts of other subgenres of fantasy. We have some that are, you know, magical realism. We even have some speculative nonfiction. Um, so maybe you can talk to what, how you see what you're doing, what mode you're working in and, and your relation to your relationship to speculative work in general. Uh, I won't call on anyone. You can jump in when you like. You have to call on us. Do I? I thought the spirit yeah. might move. Um, I would, I'd be happy to go because my brain is now on fire. Awesome. With... Ooh, all right. <laughs> I mean, even the term speculative nonfiction is such a brain bender, right? Um, I'm some, I'm a poet who's interested in like the contents of my reality being very confusing. And I think what spec the speculative form and call offered to me was a way to put words to like, me trying to just imagine the future of my connections with other people. Um, being a member of the of a diaspora puts me in an interesting place. Trying to like figure out what I am because I'm not exactly this or not exactly that. And I am from Milani, but I also think that the large, very important part of me is from Spokane and now from Montana. So I think speculative in my work rings as like how how do i imagine my relations in the future and like what is are there other ways for me to like conceptualize indigeneity for myself um in this situation of having been raised in a settler colonial context and like the poem that i read about the funeral was like these people think of me as family like why isn't it that simple and that so that's like what the speculative aspect is for me just imagining relationships in the future across these indigenous lines, or like, sorry, not indigenous, but ethnic lines that we have. Well, I would say, just in my experience, growing up in a suburb of Southern California, that uh, probably, I think it was founded, it was built in 1945. And, um, and like most people, you go to your kindergarten, and you go to your elementary school, particularly in those days. And then the first great speculative leap is junior high. And, um, and suddenly, you know, we didn't know what a feeder school was. It was like a feeder universe. And you met people from other worlds. And, you know, the way redlining and segregation worked in Long Beach, where I grew up, you didn't meet a lot of people of color until you got to junior high. And um, even though our elementary school principal was um, Hispanic, and, you know, and so junior high is this other world. And then it was like, it presents a choice to you as a person. And you go, for me, it was like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever, you know? Um, not everyone is one of these people who've been tormenting me all my life. Cause really I wasn't getting along and socially with the, uh, you know, the peer groups structured until that moment. And then I went on to uh, Long Beach Poly High School which um, is a very diverse high school. And that was for me, science fiction. <laughs> and I loved it and um, felt launched. So yeah, I think it's a, writing almost comes out of your, your life that way and like your life, the diaspora, um, it feeds the springs. Yeah, worlds within worlds. I had a discussion with some friends recently about this, about those moments in our lives when 
something happened that you didn't know could happen. And suddenly you're in a new world and we're all kind of hungry for that to happen again, but maybe it doesn't happen anymore after a certain age. I don't know. That's, that's a depressing thought. Um, who else, who else wants to jump in here? I, ideally we'll hear from everyone on this question. Uh, I can jump in real quick. Um, cool. I'm a huge fan of magical realism and fairy tales and legends in general. Um, it was kind of my escape <laughs> growing up in Boise, Idaho, uh, and not being able to navigate things as easily as I guess I should have been able to, uh, just feeling different and not feeling like I could bring what I was <laughs> in, you know, into conversations easily, even something as simple as eating rice. Um, so kind of starts there, but I do think that with the word speculative and with fiction in and of itself, I think thinking beyond what we know and thinking with what we know in different ways is something that's very important to me and kind of inner mingling past, present and future and seeing what comes out of that and thinking through that. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think we speculate all the time. I don't think it's just, um, so that I really appreciate how broad of a definition that the issue is taking because I think that it allows for us to think differently and think with others in ways that are new. Did it feel like an escape hatch to anyone here? Speculative fiction and sci-fi when you were growing up? Yeah. If you can escape deeper into a thing, maybe. <laughs> You yeah. know, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna come back to that topic of escapism in in a second, um, but maybe before that, Sloan and Ahimsa, do you want to say anything about your relationship to speculation? Sure. Um, I feel like uh, I've always been into speculative fiction, particularly because, well, I, I think I I have always been dreaming of a kind of like science fiction that is more about embodying the self in the world. I feel like a lot of science fiction is about like transcending the body, um, whether that's through like cyberpunk and digitizing the mind or in a more like Lovecraftian sense where you can transcend it in like a more horrific um, kind of like cosmic way. Um, but to me, I find the body really fascinating and kind of has like really endless potential. Um, like this story in particular, that you read from um, was inspired by a uh, this uh, mole salamander, um, which is like <laughs> a a unisexual creature, um, and it it asexually reproduces clones of itself. But to kickstart its reproduction, it needs to steal like sperm packets from other species, um, and then sometimes it'll use some of that DNA, and sometimes it won't. Um, so I'm really into the idea of like, well, in the story of like, what, what would that look like if that was a kind of like a human condition where you needed to, we had that sort of biology about us where we needed to kickstart our own reproduction with another species. Um, and just like kind of how terrifying that would be, <laughs> or, or like, how would you incorporate that, that into like a human culture? Um, yeah, and I think a lot of my work is basically like speculative anthropology. I just really like exploring human or like human adjacent creatures, um, how they develop their own perspectives and uh, of like themselves, their bodies, mm -hmm. and the world around them that I end up building. Um, but yeah, I just find the body uh, and its limitations very generative um not just our body but animal bodies plant bodies the planet itself like yeah yeah you're, you're making me think of um ursula Le Guin, whose yeah. his dad was a very famous anthropologist right and and her yes. book the left hand of darkness which i think was inspired by the parrotfish yeah the, yeah it's uhu in hawaii yeah um but also octavia butler my favorite story of hers is blood child yes um and that one's based on her terror of the bot fly right yeah Which, yeah yeah exactly those are both some major touchstone creators for me yeah oh me too cool in fact our i, I don't know if you all know this our um our epigraph for this this collection comes from octavia butler who wrote in a book that has never come out come out and i guess never will um in her draft of parable of the trickster she wrote there's nothing new under the sun but there are new suns 
Hell yeah. Um, finally, I said, did you want to say anything about your relationship to speculative stuff? Sure. Yeah. Like, I feel like speculation for me, when I think about has so much to do with theorizing, with activism, with like decolonial or sovereign imaginaries. Like, I feel like, like as a multiply oppressed peoples, like we often have to imagine the possibility of us even living another day, you know, as well as what it would mean for our larger communities to survive or have like other possibilities. And I feel whether it's looking in Hanani K. Trask's work or Beth Brandt or Sherry Moraga or so many other womanist and queer indigenous writers, um, is there's that looking forward while we're looking back and looking both beyond and within simultaneously. And I feel like poesis, like creativity as a whole, like has so much to do with imagining what could like then practically be possible like what could we create what could we organize so i feel like i feel like imagination is radical it's rooted and it makes new things possible it makes us possible yeah awesome answer and it, it happens to be a great segue to what i think is my next question um we were talking a minute ago about escapism uh, i'm going to read just one i think one paragraph from uh, our intro the editor's intro in the 20th century, science fiction and fantasy were often derided as escapist. But from here in the 21st, it has become clear that speculative art can be a tool for helping us navigate our way toward better futures. Some cognitive scientists, and this was Yasmin's point actually, have even proposed that anticipating possible futures is fundamentally what consciousness is for, the brain as probability matrix or what if machine. In a time when billionaires are buying bunkers in Aotearoa and flying rockets into space while COVID-19 mutates and climate catastrophe moves squarely into the daily news, speculative thinking, be it literal as in some SF or metaphorical as in other varieties of fantasy, it feels less like a luxury than a necessity. What after all could be more escapist in 2022 than a realism that fails to build climate change into its model of the world? Oh yeah, the metaverse. So I think the, the question I, I have there is something to do with, you know, you've, you've, you've all said what kind of, um, what kind of, you know, mode you're working in. Um, and, and some of you have answered this question already to some degree, but I guess I'm wondering, what's it for? Do you see, why do you do this? this maybe this is an existential question, you know, are, are you, um, are you just, if there's a spectrum from, well, maybe there are two spectrums. I'm seeing a spectrum from escapist to kind of activist, but also from you know, art for art's sake, I'm going to make a beautiful object to I'm going to change the world. You know, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering why are you doing this? There's, there's not a ton of money in it. You know that. So what? why <laughs> for most of us? Um, anybody want to weigh in there? Uh, to work through pain. Mm. I think it's a way to heal. And I think it's also a way to create a space that is unimaginable, but you can enter into it and you can figure it out through reading. I think without speculative to fiction, for me, <laughs> life would not be great. Uh, what ifs can really save your life, right? Yeah. Somebody else want to jump on on that one? I hear you, Yasmin, about pain. Um, you know, I think I've been in a few hospitals in my life, and uh, and even as a child, it was in for quite a spell. And there was this wonderful cloud feeling. You're trapped in the bed, and you're you're in pain, but you don't. You're giving you drugs, and you know. So that was one way the mind was free and cut loose, sort of unfettered. And, uh, and then there's the psychic pain of getting through life. And when I said, I didn't say escapism, I said escape hatch. And for me, it's like, if I couldn't write, man, the pressure cooker would just blow me apart, I think. Um, and it's probably true for a lot of writers.
I resonate with the idea of <clears throat> using the, like the speculative, but also the writing process more generally as a way of exploring pain um, as a matter of self-soothing. I also think that part of it is um, alongside that, and maybe as another way of framing the idea of self-soothing, like um, as someone who doesn't have access to their indigenous language, to only have access to the language that is considered the colonial language. And I even think that calling English a, the language of colonization is its own extension of colonialism, which is unfortunate. But like I personally like love English, but I know I recognize that it's been used as a tool of harm. And so how do I how do I operate as an English speaker, but still like, you know, and that's a lot of speculative work. And I think that poetry, I think that's why I became a poet is because I needed a way out of English that was still English adjacent because I love English. Um, but there are ways, and Kathy Park Kong, I think calls it uh, um, something I shouldn't say on the internet, but essentially a, a like a proponent of bad English. Um, being a powerful tool that people in between languages have. And I think the poems that I submitted, like have, that I have published in Bamboo Ridge Press are like um, me moving, like they reflect that I'm moving toward this, like messing with English as a way to understand English itself. So, and that to me is deeply comforting because it's like a personal language that I have, you know, that, it doesn't matter if someone else understands it. Like it, that's the art for art's sake part, right? Like I'm trying to address all parts of the spectrum, but yeah, that's me. Ahimsar, Sloan, you want to say anything about why you do this? I won't make you. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I resonate with what everyone said so far. Um, making art, whether it's visual or in prose or poetry, um, helps externalize ideas and emotions. Um, it makes them graspable and containable. And I feel like that uh, helps in a way, whether it's to process pain or to, or just for fun. A lot of my ideas, I'm just driven by curiosity um, and that entertains me to see where I can take certain ideas or what, um, I don't know, where those ideas will surprise me if I follow them um, closely enough. Uh, but yeah, um, I feel like the activist thing is interesting because it's like, I I don't know. I mean, my work is very much about like confronting the idea of like, how do we live in harmony with each other, with our planet with uh, like animal life. Um, and I feel like we know, we already know how to do that. <laughs> like mm. the answer is actually very simple. Um, and so I don't really think about that because I feel like you, people are either going to already know that or they're going to be part of the problem and not care. <laughs> I really don't think it's a mystery for people how to solve any of these problems that we have. Mm. Um, so I don't, I don't approach it. I think from that pers from that point of like, trying to change pe people's minds. I am just trying to be as honest as possible with my ideas and emotions, I guess. Yeah, you're, Sloan is also a visual artist. I don't know if, did I mention this already? I don't think so. I have a story coming out in a British magazine uh, in a few months and it just so happens that Sloan made the really lovely cover for it. Um, Sloan, I'm wondering, does, does art do the same, does visual art do the same thing for you? It's same, same deal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, it's a, it's interesting, right? Because it's like I have to choose like what I'm creating, um, what type of control I want. Visual control is very powerful. I can make, you know, the reader, um, I can force them to view a character in a certain way, view their acting in a certain way. I can also introduce textures, colors, things that you couldn't get in prose. Um, but yeah, I would say they serve, you know, mostly the same, the same function and, and how I approach them. Cool. Um, lastly, Ahimsa, if Thank you want. You. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, writing kept me alive. Reading kept me alive. Um, 
if it wasn't reading Christos's work, if it wasn't reading Barbara Smith or Gamzala Chu Lord, when I read Sister Outsider as a teenager in one night, like I woke up in shock the next morning, literally saying for multiple minutes, I just woke up, I just woke up, I just woke up. I I literally had language to describe my life finally. And I feel I feel like writing and the other art forms make our lives possible. And I feel like for me, Sloan, like hearing you read tonight or hearing your words read at least um, was such a gift as was it to hear other people's work. And I guess like for me, like I think about how can our words or art make other words or other art possible in different ways? Because I felt like hearing your work was like world making and to like, to imagine that we can have this world, other worlds that we can share worlds that these worlds could survive. That's such a gift. And I feel so many of our peoples are so precariously placed in the world and we don't talk really about how we nearly didn't make it. And so when I read Alice Walker's work, you know, she was the first person of color I ever read, first indigenous, black, queer, mixed race person that I read. And she, by charting her life, it made it possible for me to chart mine. And I feel that that's what we can do is we can provide new maps in some kind of way so people can, you know, do their own cartographies of survival. So thank you. It wasn't it um, Martin Amos's dad who wrote an early history of science fiction that was titled, I think, New Maps of Hell. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. I think we're talking about uh, hope. I thought your answer was really beautiful. Here's the last paragraph of our introduction. We wrote, one phrase the editors tossed around while drafting this issue's call for submissions was imagining otherwise. Rendered that way, speculative thinking reveals itself as a very close cousin to hope. We still have some. Here's hoping you do too. Um, and it sure sounds like uh, you do. I remember being in high school and seeing a bumper sticker on a car. It said, art saves lives. And um, I liked it, I, but I, I also thought it was not literal. And, but now I'm 44. And uh, I think I, I can say the same. It's certainly saved my life. Um, we're, our, we're, we're basically at the end of our, we're actually a little past our time, but I have one more question just really quickly. Maybe you can name one speculative book or short story or something by someone else that you recommend to all of us. I'll start. Um, I've been reading Stanislav Lem. He was a really interesting Polish writer who kind of was independently inventing science fiction behind the Iron Curtain. When he finally got access to Anglo-American stuff, he thought it was all garbage, except for Philip K. Dick. He kind of liked Philip K. Dick. Uh, he's best known for his, his novel Solaris. So that's probably the place to start. Well, you mentioned Philip K. Dick. <clears throat> so I went on a, a Philip K. Dick binge. And I got to spend the night in his childhood bedroom in Berkeley. Wow. Unfortunately, it was filled with these cats. And I'm allergic, but I, I went out actually and sought this bedroom and I met a person and I said, can I just spend the night? Um, the thing is the perfection of one or two works of his or the omniscience, or maybe it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, make people kind of forget the rest of his work. He was a really weird suburban freak and through a scanner darkly set in Orange County about the 1980s, is a really weird crime novel where everyone has to is addicted to the same drug. And um, it's a really gritty, like Elmore Leonard style crime novel. And yet it's science fiction. Recommended. I, I would say <laughs> Helen Oyemi's uh, Is Your Blood as Red as This? I got very addicted to her work. So. Um, I just I read all of Victoria Chang's Dear Memory in one sitting. Um, so if that's a title you haven't come across yet, deep, deeply recommend. It's a bunch of it's a series of um, it's an epistolary and it's a series of letters to things that things or people that are existing or not. And I just think it's such an interesting, like 
I mean, memory is one of those, like you touch it and it changes is what is some, how someone just recently described memory and for to be writing letters to memory is really beautiful. I cried within four pages, diasporic tears all the way down my face. <laughs> I'll mention a few names real quick. Um, I'm excited about queer Maori writer Tama Wise's work. I'm excited about, I'm gonna call them out, like Kai Gaspar, queer Hawaiian writer's work that hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of in the future. Kaylee McKenzie, who's one of the editors, has a lot of geeky, nerdy, speculative stuff. So I'm looking for multiple full books from them, another queer Hawaiian writer. Um, and then uh, definitely also want to mention a uh, trans Haudenosaunee Anishinaabe playwright, um, Ty Defoe, who also is a multi-genre writer. There's so many great people doing work. And, and I think in many ways, so much indigenous lit period is speculative in terms of articulating new survivals. And in that vein, I'll say Deborah Miranda's, who's uh, Esselin and Chumash, like queer writers, done tremendous work and really looking forward to future work from her. Um, I'll recommend um, The Raw Shark Text by uh, Stephen Hall. Um, it's a really cool postmodern kind of like sci-fi mystery story. Um, it follows this guy. He wakes up with that almost no memory at all and starts receiving packages from himself from the past. Um, and he's being pursued by this conceptual predator that feeds on um memories and the self uh, and there's lots of concrete poetry in it as this predator takes the shape of like things in the world uh it's super cool i highly recommend it yeah i did read that one actually when it came out whenever that was 15 years ago or something the title is a pun on rorschach test right yeah <laughs> it's the raw shark to help me Te the raw shark text yeah <laughs> the raw shark text right yeah yeah <laughs> All right, well, I, I, th I think it's time for us to peace out. This was um, so fun and I'm so happy to, to meet you all and maybe we can meet somewhere in the flesh someday. Um, but thank you so much for submitting work to this issue and thank you for sharing it with us tonight. This has been a total delight. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you everyone. Uh, I thought the readings were quite remarkable. And, uh, I certainly look forward to reading them on the page, though I, I, I think it was, um, so someone suggested that there should be an audio book, and I certainly sound right to me. Anyway, I really appreciate what you guys have put together, and uh, thank you very much. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.